So, when you look at the cross, what do you see? Now, obviously, when you look at the cross, it's hard not to see the cross itself and the horror of the cross. And here's just a little bit about the cross and the the kind of execution the cross was. Crucifixion was often performed to terrorize and dissuade its witnesses from perpetrating particular heinous crimes. Victims were left on display after death as warnings to others who might attempt dissent. Crucifixion was usually intended to provide a death that was particularly slow, painful, hence the the term excruciating, literally, out of crucifying, gruesome, humiliating, and public, using whatever means were most expedient for that goal. In some cases, the condemned was forced to carry the crossbeam on his shoulders to the place of execution. A whole cross would weigh well over 300 pounds, but the crossbeam would not be quite as burdensome, weighing about 100 pounds. Upright posts would presumably be fixed permanently in that place, and the crossbeam with the condemned person perhaps already nailed to it would then be attached to the post. While a crucifixion was an execution, it was also a humiliation by making the condemned as vulnerable as possible. Cicero described crucifixion as a most cruel and disgusting punishment and suggested that the very mention of the cross should be far removed not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and his ears. Frequently, the legs of the person executed were broken or shattered with an iron club. This act hastened the death of the person, but was also meant to deter those who observed the crucifixion from committing offenses. Crucifixion, being nailed to the cross, was perhaps the most inhumane, barbaric form of execution ever devised by human beings. It was a horrific way to die. And many people believe that Jesus, as he was growing up, saw many crosses and crucifixions because it was the way that Rome flexed its muscles and very visibly says, you cross us and you'll end up on the cross. And so Jesus probably lived in the shadow of the cross from time to time. Mel Gibson, in his movie, The Passion of the Christ, really focused his attention on the brutality of the cross because he wanted us to see the depths of God's love and the sacrifice of Jesus through the brutality of what he went through. Now, it is true that Jesus suffered a horrific death, but the reality is that other people suffered the exact same death that Jesus did, and we don't talk about their deaths. So while it's important for us to always remember the horrific nature of the cross, it's also important to remember that the cross itself is not the main focus. The main issue is who is it who's on the cross and why is he there and what difference does it make? And so again, the question, when you look at the cross, what do you see? Or maybe better said, when you look at the cross, who do you see and what does it mean? Some of the people who were there at the cross that day saw an enemy of Rome hanging on the cross. Jesus was ultimately executed by the Roman Empire for an act of insurrection. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be a king. He claimed to be a Caesar. And in the Roman Empire, there was only one Son of God. There was only one emperor. There was only one Caesar. And that was the Roman emperor. And if you claimed allegiance to any other king but Caesar, if you claimed to be a king yourself you were immediately executed for insurrection. And so Jesus hung there as an enemy of the, of the empire. Others saw an enemy of the Jews because Jesus had claimed to be God. So he hung there either because he was misguided at the very least or he was a man demon-possessed at the very worst, but he claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be equal with God, and that was blasphemy. That was heresy, and it was punishable by death. Now, the Romans didn't allow the Jews to do the death sentence anymore, and so they worked with, some of them worked with the Romans to make sure that Jesus was crucified. Maybe there were some who just didn't know much about Jesus and saw him hanging on a cross and assumed he was a criminal of some kind. Or maybe they walked by and thought, there's another innocent man being sacrificed at the hands of this tyranny 
called Rome. But take a deeper look. Because beneath the despair and the suffering and the darkness and the God-forsakenness and the death, the early followers of Jesus saw something remarkable. They saw God on that cross, the creator of the universe. The same God who in Genesis chapter 1 spoke out of nothingness and by the power of his word brought the entire universe into being. The same God who through the power of his word parted the Red Sea so the people of Israel could walk through on dry land. The same God who, fired down, who breathed down fire from heaven to burn up Elijah's sacrifice. The same God who shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was thrown in. The same God who through the voice of Jesus calmed the raging storm. Shrouded in weakness, hidden in darkness and despair and God-forsakenness, the early followers of Jesus saw God being crucified. For the early followers of Jesus, the cross was not the main focus. Their main focus was who it was who was on the cross and why he was there. And when they looked at the cross, they saw God in the person of Jesus. They saw the face of grace. They saw a grace so committed to us that God was willing to go even to the death so that he could restore us as his sons and daughters, so that he could find us. They saw a grace so bold that the cross says even today that nothing, neither death nor life, Neither our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, neither our sin nor the gates of hell itself will ever keep anything from blocking God's way to us. God will never be stopped in his pursuit of us. They saw the face of love, absolute love, unconditional love, a love that accepts us just as we are, that is a transformational love, a giving love, a sacrificial love, a generous love. They saw a battle being waged, a battle between God and the ultimate enemies that we face, the devil, death, and sin. And Jesus did battle against them on the cross so that he could remove their grip from our lives once and for all and we could live in the grip of grace. And they saw God, the creator of the universe, hanging on that cross, absorbing into himself the sin of his creation the brokenness of his creation, the sickness of his creation, taking it into himself so that we wouldn't have to bear it anymore. When they looked at the cross, they saw a love that is no greater than the love that lays down one's life for a friend. When you look at the cross, what do you see? Isaac Watts is known as the father of English hymnody or English hymn writing. He changed the way that hymns were sung in the Christian church back in the 1700s. Up to that point, when hymns were sung in the church, they were normally lifted right out of Scripture. So you would sing the words of the Psalms or you would sing words from other Scripture passages. He had the audacity to write some of his own poetry and turn them into hymns. To write lyrics about his experience of Jesus. To write lyrics about our experience as a church, about God and about Jesus. And used more modern language at that time, to speak about God. And when he looked at the cross, this is what Isaac Watts saw. When I survey the wondrous cross
hands, his feet, sorrow and love flowing down. Such love and sorrow me all thoughts compose so rich a crown Would the whole realm of me that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my my life, my all. Now, if that's true, if it's true that it was really God on the cross, if it's true that on that cross was our Creator doing battle for us against sin, death, and the devil, if it's true that the Creator of the universe was on that cross absorbing my sin, your sin, our sicknesses, our brokenness, the, the brokenness of the world, if it's true that on the cross we see the face of grace, the boundless depths of God's love for us, then may that amazing love and the demand of that amazing love capture your soul, your life, and your all. And may God's grip of grace never let you go. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's almost inconceivable for us that somehow in some way on that cross 2,000 years ago, you died. God died. And yet in that moment, all of creation shook. The shudder reverberated throughout history. But if that moment hadn't have happened, then grace couldn't happen. And so, Heavenly Father, a love that deep, a love that amazing, a love that sacrificial, it does demand everything of us. But it's not a demand of law, but a demand of grace. And we ask that your grip of grace would capture us, soul, life, our all, and we would live as people of the cross, forgiven and graced. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.